Right, let's see if this is working. Uh, hello, everybody. We are getting ready to just start this webinar now. And um, I was hoping that some of you could chat in and uh, use the chat on the right and write in and let me know that you can hear me, see me, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I want to make sure that we have our, yep, there's Yolanda. Why don't you guys do me a favor and uh, here we go. Write in and tell me where you guys are coming in from. I'm going to give this a couple of minutes. We've got somebody from Florida here. I can see you and hear you. That is always a good sign. Step one, hearing. Yes, we have a really interesting, oh, all right, we got Zurich, Arizona, New York. I knew there would be all over the place. Calgary, Portland, Ontario. It's probably still cold up there. Fayetteville, all right. Scotland, did I see? Wow, Colombia, right on, Latin America. Brazil. Excellent. So I'm going to give this just a couple of minutes before we uh, we start, make sure people have enough time to get on here. Really interesting program today. Luckily, I am only going to be a teeny part of it because we have a, a superstar celebrity guest. I'm just going to label him celebrity. And, and I came up with a good description of him when I make the intro. I, I think it'll, in, in, so I came up with a Star Wars analogy that I think will work fine. I'm very nervous now. No, it'll be, uh, it'll be good. Having met you online now twice, I... 100% assured that this is the right analogy. All right, so we have tons of people coming in here. California, Massachusetts, Spain. Wow, always impressed by the range of uh, attendee, range of region that these webinars go out to. Germany. And uh, okay, I'm gonna give it one, 30 more seconds and then we're gonna start here. Are we supposed to be seeing a split window, you guys at the top and then another window? Yes, I'm, we are gonna start in one look and view. You're gonna see both of us. I'm gonna make a couple of housekeeping announcements. I'm gonna intro who our guest speaker is and then I'm going to disappear and he's gonna take over as presenter and, uh, and then I will magically reappear at the end of the webinar, maybe, if it, uh, if it works out that way. Holland. All right, so let's um, let's get started here. So our special guest today is <clears throat> is Kelly Gallagher, who is the vice president of content acquisitions at Ingram Content Group. And so I thought about that for a long time, and I think that the easiest way to think about him is the in the Star Wars terms, he's the Obi Wan Kenobi of Ingram distribution. <laughs> he's very calm. He's very collected. And he very casually knows everything about what's important. So he has the force of book distribution uh, going for him. He's going to get to his presentation in a second. But before we start, I need to give a few housekeeping items. And then I want to give you just a quick philosophy and run through of Blurb and uh, the, the, the uh, distribution options before we get to Ingram in depth. So the housekeeping is you can use the chat on the right to comment and make questions, which many of you already have. So thank you very much for doing that. Uh, the Blurb team, who is at least three strong back at the Blurb office, they're going to add resources during the webinar. And you can look for them when there's a red notification in the upper right-hand corner. So there's going to be a nice, uh, actually a beautiful downloadable handout that they've created for you, uh, which I have sitting right next to me. So it's a really well done piece. And um, by the way, uh, Q&A is going to be at the end of the webinar, although we are going to be going through specific questions as we, as we head through. And uh, if you missed this webinar or you missed last month's webinar, you can find it on YouTube. So the, the gist of this is about Ingram distribution, but I just wanted to mention one thing. A friend of mine who's a very successful bookmaker, publisher, he did a, uh, his first book a few years ago, and he said to me, when the book was completed, I really thought the hard work was done. It took him so long to put the book together, and he thought, okay, you know, everything's done. The book is complete, so my, the hard work is over. And he said, what I didn't realize was I was just at the bottom of the mountain. I still had to climb the mountain. And historically, for me personally, the two big areas that need to be addressed are marketing and distribution. We've done some webinars on marketing in the past and we'll continue to do some in the future. That is something that uh, is very, it's almost like your fingerprint. You as an artist bring a certain ability to market to the table. And in some cases that's enough and in other cases you have to uh, supplement that with other means. The second part of this is distribution. And distribution is getting your, your, your beloved book out into the world. And just in a nutshell, before we get to Ingram in depth, is I wanted to just mention the three general ways of distributing through Blurb. The first being the Blurb bookstore. And the bookstore is what I would say is the, is the simplest way of putting a book out, which is when you upload a book to the Blurb ecosystem, it lands on your author page. And from that page, you're able to control the life of that book, whether or not it's public or private, whether or not you want to sell it, what kind of versions you want to sell, et cetera. 
and you can drive your customers to it and they can order directly from the Blurb site, the books printed and shipped to them. It's fairly straightforward. The second method is Amazon. And this is where things get a little more complex. There's a few more hoops that you need to jump through. But Amazon is, uh, is something we get questioned about a lot. People are very adamant about getting their books on there. If you've got an audience of people and you can drive them to Amazon, it's a wonderful place to put your book. Um, but it is the second main option of distribution. And the third option, which is what brings us to this webinar today, is the Ingram Distribution Network or the Global Retail Network. And this is an incredible system. Uh, there is some complexity to it, and thankfully, that's why we have Mr. Gallagher with us today. So I, I am I going to – wait, say that again? I thought I was Obi-Wan Kenobi. Well, you are. I, I'll just refer to you as Obi-Wan for the, for the rest – for the remainder of this presentation. So I'm going uh, to step back here, turn off my camera. We're going to turn the presentation over to Kelly. And again, you can send your, your questions in on chat, and, um, and then we will reconnect again at the end of the, of the, end of the webinar. Great. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm uh, glad to be here. I'm going to now perform the hardest trick of the, uh, the the webinar, and that is to attempt to share my screen. So um, give me just a half a second. And uh, Dan, you can confirm if, uh, if, I've, if I've gotten, if I've succeeded yep. in this, this part. All right. Perfect. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, Good afternoon, good morning, good evening uh, to uh, all of you uh, from around the world. Um, thank you for the uh, uh, Obi Wan. That that's a, that's a pretty a tall order, and I appreciate that. I guess I would make one caveat to that, Dan, and and think of me, and think of Ingram not just as as Obi Wan Kenobi, but maybe Obi Wan Kenobi from the Lego Movie. And, and the reason I say that is that when you think about Ingram, and I just want to do a couple slides just to set the stage to help some people who maybe aren't as familiar with, with what it is that Ingram does in the book publishing industry, um, think of Ingram as this Lego that sits in the middle, this connector that has both the ability to connect to a publisher or author, and then also the ability to connect to a channel of distribution. And that's really just a fancy way of saying connecting to a retailer, whether they're an online retailer, a, um, a bookstore, a library, um, a, um, a large discount chain that also happens to sell books. Really the way that you think about Ingram is you think about how you want to make your book more widely known is to think about Ingram as that, that central connection point for your book. Um, everything that we do, and, and Ingram certainly offers a lot of different kinds of services. We've been around since, gosh, 1965 in some form serving the publishing industry. But when you, when you think about Ingram, regardless of whatever the service is, everything that we do is typically tied to some form of distribution, whether it's physical, or digital content. And so uh, connection is kind of the, the key way that um, you need to think about Ingram, and especially as we talk about uh, today's session. So there's a lot of requirements for us when we, uh, when we get into this, this connection or this, this distribution model to serve you as an author or a small press in how we make your books more widely available. Um, it's interesting. Um, if, uh, if you looked in the dictionary at what the word publish meant, um, it actually, in the Webster Dictionary, um, it says to make words more widely known. And I think that's kind of cool, right? So your goal of wanting your words to be known, uh, whether it's um, a book that you're publishing just for your own family, or in the case where you want to actually make your book more widely available, um, Ingram is, is that kind of company that helps you make your book more widely known. And so um, our strategic direction is pretty simple. It's providing that, that connection, like I said. And we do this, um, and we're required to do it now at a, at a level that um, is able to provide that consumer instant access to the content, whether the book exists in a, a, a physical inventory form or not. And so for Ingram, um, our requirement is that anytime we receive an order from a retailer, an e-tailer, 
um, et cetera, we've got to be able to fulfill that order within 24 hours. Um, thanks to Amazon, that's a good thing. Um, the expectation of the consumer is that when they place an order, that that book will make it to them uh, within a very short amount of time. The other thing that we focus on is being able to do that through a print-on-demand model, meaning how can we uh, reduce the risk uh, that a publisher has to take in order to get that wider distribution. And so for us, print-on-demand, and I'll talk about it in, in just a moment in a little more depth, but um, for us, print-on-demand is a critical way to do that. Um, at Ingram, um, we actually only stock in our inventory globally about 800,000 titles. Now that sounds pretty impressive, but um, the reality is, is that um, we actually have in our library over 16 million books available. How do we do that? Uh, we do that through a print-on-demand model, meaning at any point, if a store or an e-tailer or anyone wanting a book from Ingram um, places that order, um, if it's not something that we actively stock, then we can produce it and ship it out to that uh, retailer or e-tailer very quickly uh, without any significant costs incurred by the publisher having to maintain an inventory of printing ahead, et cetera. So it's a really important um, component of how we add value into the market and reduce the risk for uh, a publisher in, in getting their books more widely known. Um, a couple other market realities I just want to touch on real quick. Um, you know, traditional printing and stocking is a costly model. In the old days, in order to get your book into a bookstore, you typically had to do a long print run, whether or not you knew uh, if the book would sell. Ingram would have to buy that inventory, typically, or a wholesaler would have to buy that inventory. The store would have to buy that inventory. And it was all very speculative. And the risk of that book uh, not selling um, was, was a big risk that a lot of people took. Well, bring on the advent of the internet and uh, online selling, where essentially a consumer is paying ahead of time for a title. Um, so the risk is reduced to the retailer. Um, and then also bring on POD, where uh, an author or a publisher now no longer needs to speculatively print. Um, suddenly, we've changed the whole dynamics of how we can get books into the market, especially when we don't know when or who or where that book is going to sell. And so for us, this is a really critical component to how we can add value to you when you choose to put a book in through the blurb process at Ingram. All right, so far so good. Um, if I were to say it more simply, um, I think this this slide kind of is is really the playbook of, of how you need to think about putting a book into the Ingram channel um, as a POD book. In the old days, you print the book first and then you sell the book, hopefully. In the new day, um, we sell the book first for you and then we end up printing the book. And so, while returns are a requirement for um, selling through Blurb, um, our average return rate is typically less than uh, 2%. I think it's just over a percent. And so um, really the, the risk is, is absolutely minimized when you go and work with Ingram and uh, work in a process where we're actually selling the book first before we're actually printing it. Completely different model. All right, so with that, um, we're going to, uh, Dan and I got together ahead of time and, and he thought of some great questions to maybe ones that you're already thinking about. And so um, why, why don't we go through yeah. the questions, Dan, and I'll do my best to, to answer them and hopefully they'll spur some more questions from our listeners. We had our entire R&D team, you know, feverishly working on these questions because as, as the Obi-Wan of distribution, I mean, we had to really have up our game. So. Um, what uh, this is a question we get all the time. What types of titles best qualify for print on demand? Well, um, you know, uh, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna give you a pretty broad answer, but I'll I'll try to narrow it down for you. And that is uh, with this slide. 
all titles. Uh, quite honestly, today, uh, print on demand, and especially print on demand through the distribution channel, um, really is an indication. This 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 um, this pie chart is an indication that any kind any any possible title that has market interest could sell through print on demand in the distribution channel. But the two that I think are most important for you to see here are author services. Thirty percent of the titles that sell through. Um, the Ingram Distribution Network are from authors, uh, just like many that are on the call today. Um, and so it's really the primary way in which you have access into the large uh, market. So, so what kind of authors' uh, titles? Trade books certainly, you know, are a large portion of that. And when I say trade, I mean anything from a children's title to a fiction title, to perhaps a more popular nonfiction title. But as you make your way around the circle there, um, you'll see really it's, it's a wide cross section. So academic, professional, um, small press, university press, religious titles, um, mass custom, um, those are like the, the big thick paperback uh, titles, um, education, et cetera. So really it's, it's, a, it's a large cross section. Um, that we see selling through the market today. Just a quick, um, in reference to that, um, the slide prior to that, you mentioned that the, the erratic nature of the industry. And do you think ultimately, when I look at that pie chart, that circular chart of what's happening, do you think the erratic uh, nature of the industry, has that benefited um, people just because uh, maybe the, the presses are realizing, look, there's a lot of people out there with talent that are writing about specific, very specific things that we might not have touched on before? Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to talk a little bit about how you make those books more widely known, but that, that's a really great point. The, you may have uh, heard uh, of the term called the long tail. And the long tail basically is, you know, where on a curve, you've got many of the large presses out there today, whether it's Penguin Random House or Hachette. And then you've got this sloping level of sales that goes on and on and on. And so what we've seen over the last five years is a thickening of the long tail, meaning if you can create discoverability for your book, um, the odds of it selling today are greatly increased over um, another book such that it becomes really um, something that the, uh, the analytics people in the industry really can't predict for as far as you know, where or how or when a book will sell, whether it's a, a big front list author or a poetry book. Poetry books, great example of that, um, today are just absolutely taking off and nobody would have predicted that. And, and it's not from any big brand name author. It's, it's very erratic, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's what is kind of the, the hot topic of the day. Excellent. And okay, next question. What happens when a title goes into distribution? Well, um, this is kind of where the magic happens. Um, and so um, at, at Ingram, uh, when you put a title into wholesale distribution, essentially what you're doing is you are putting your book into a database of retail globally uh, of about 38,000 different retailers. And so we'll talk a little bit more about the data feed and how retailers see that or libraries see that. But quite literally, when you opt into Ingram Wholesale, you know, beyond just Amazon, and, and you know, rightly so, people are very focused on getting their books up and for sale in Amazon. Um, you know, that is, you know, largely where a lot of books sell. Um, however, if you if you only think about Amazon, you're really not covering as much of the market as you should. And so, from our perspective, we would say um, you really need to think well beyond Amazon. And just some of these logos are examples of globally um, when that book goes into the distribution network, suddenly it lights up, as they say, um, across all the different retail and uh, and library markets uh, around the world. Um, quick, quick question about that. Again, I have I have millions of questions. There was something that jumped out at me. Third row down, second from the right is Books Kinakunya. 
The uh, Kina Cunha in Sydney is one of my all-time favorite bookstores. And let's say that I, I've been there and I think that I have something that is, you know, would be relevant to them. But is there, and, and I have no idea if this is a possibility, but is there a way for like me to put the book into distribution with, and to make sure that someone like Kina Cunha specifically sees it? Great, great. That's actually a really great point. And so for a small author or a small publisher, um, your ability to uh, directly go and sell to a particular store is going to be very limited unless it's a, a regional title that they might speculatively take one or two of. But um, again, they've got to, you've got to create a, um, an account relationship with that store. And so what many will default to is they'll say, is the book in Ingram and can I pick it up from Ingram? And so again, if you've put your book into the Ingram Wholesale Network, the folks at uh, Kina Cunha can easily go in and see that the book has now been made available and they could order it and put it in their store based on your direct engagement with them, but not necessarily trying to create a sales relationship with them. Does that answer the question? Absolutely, absolutely, thank you. And okay, next question. How do retailers and libraries order your books? So yeah, so we're gonna get into a little bit of the nuts and bolts, but I think it's really important um, that, that um, the, the listeners really understand kind of what happens behind the scene to ensure that we can make your books visible and available. And so um, I mentioned iPage. So, you know, for the big retailers like Amazon, Barnes and Noble, we've got these big industrial pipes that send data back and forth and whether it's book data or an order, um, et cetera. And so when you, when you put your book in distribution, rest assured for the big retail outlets, especially in the U S and the UK and Australia, we're, we're sending those data feeds directly to them. But for all of the independents, uh, for all of the small and regional chains globally, what they rely on uh, through Ingram or Ingram International is a, a tool called iPage. And what that is essentially is what you see on the screen here. Um, any retailer or library um, has free access to Ingram iPage. They can search for you as an author by name, um, if you've done good keywords, et cetera, or just by the book title or ISBN, they can find your title and, and order it for their store. Um, again, whether you're doing, uh, let's say, an, an author signing, this is likely what they're going to use to, uh, to order those books in. Um, or, again, if you've done some social networking um, and they learned about your book in some way, they're likely going to go to Ingram iPage to pick that title up. Okay, a uh, quick question in regards to that. Um, yeah. on, a scale of, on a scale of 1 to 10, first-time author putting a book into Ingram, into Ingram would you give them a give them a rating scale of how they handle their keywords? Is it from one to ten? Are they do most people are are they down in the two level and they're just not giving the keywords the right attention, or are they all up at ten and the keywording is brilliant? Oh, that's not a fair question. I don't want people to like shut off and not like me. But here's what I'll say: is um, apart from your listeners today, uh, even the largest publishers typically score very low when it comes to treating your metadata, that's what we call it. It's, it's an industry jargon word for how well do you treat the information about your book. Most do not score very well, Dan. And to me, it's the one single easiest thing you can do um, to help improve your saleability. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment. But yeah, um, your ability to make your book more widely known and discoverable is really your key to having your book sold. Okay. Excellent. So yeah, just just uh, here's a, another pic pretty picture that just kind of shows, you know, um, from a publisher perspective, um, how iPage works. It takes all the information and then just pushes it out to small, medium, and large. Okay. Next question: How do I increase the likelihood of my title being discovered and sold? Okay. So so this this is really a, a good follow on uh, from your, your previous question. There are several key components that you have to consider when you want to put your book into distribution or really make it for sale beyond just your mom and your dad or your, your children. Um, when you want to bring it into the marketplace, there's, there's several things you absolutely have to pay attention to. And the first thing is price uh, makes sense, right? So, um, 
one of the things that a lot of uh, authors fail or forget to do is really understand, you know, for the book that they're producing, what is what is the current going rate for that kind of title? <clears throat> now, obviously, it's going to vary, and it can vary sometimes by 30 or 40 percent. And depending on what you want to make for the title, um, you know, your price can um, uh, can be on the high side or the low side. One thing I would say a, a common mistake that a lot of authors make is they feel like they've got to um, put a low price point on the title. That's not always the case. Um, I would say you know medium to medium high is um, is is absolutely fine because we're going to talk about the the discount concept in just a moment. But from a pricing perspective, again, um, I would say make sure that you're in the range. Um, and don't necessarily be concerned that you're at the low range in order to achieve your sale. Second thing is metadata. And this is actually a blurb title, I think. Um, uh, and um, the metadata, again, fancy word for um, how you present the title when it, you're going to fill out um, all of the information on the book. So there's a description of the title. Um, my recommendation is that your description should not be anything more than 50 words. If it's too long, it uh, could wrap off the page or it would appear to be uh, way too complex or something that, again, uh, think about how this is going to look on the, on the screen or for a particular retailer that's potentially buying this title. Um, you want to make sure that your descriptions are succinct um, and keywords. Uh, when you think about the keywords, there's a section in your metadata that you can actually put in keywords. Think about think about it like a consumer, not like not like the author, but think about what are the things that you would be searching for in a Google search for your book. So if if those are the if those are the things that you would search for in a Google search, those are probably the keywords that you need to make sure are listed for your book. Um, two other quick things related to your the data that you put around the book. The title. Um, what I would say is um, there are artistic titles that don't sell much <laughs> um, unless your, your name uh, is uh, like um, uh, Patterson or, um, or someone along those famous lines. Or um, there are titles that are a bit more descriptive. So what I love about this is it's not just called the unicorn. It's called a coloring book because that's what it is. Make sure that your title um, hopefully has some level of um, uh, understanding, especially if you're not writing a, uh, a fiction book. Um, and, then, and then the last area is something that's called a BISAC code. Uh, a book uh, industry standard code is essentially a set of codes that were created for retailers to know where to shelve your book. In the um, outside the U.S., they're called FEMA codes. It's probably something that we'll put in our FAQs that you can go and look up later. But the reality is that most search engines use these special codes in order to understand um, where and how to find a book. In fact, we find that a book that has no code um, is, I think, the last research we did, six to eight times less likely to sell than a book that has at least one code. And a book that has three descriptors um, is, I think, three or four times even more likely to sell the, than a book that has one. So I know metadata is like watching paint dry, but I can't emphasize enough that if you really discount metadata is really uh -oh. what got a book together. There we go. Oh, I'm sorry. You, you froze there just for a second, but I think, um, I think that that's a really great point you, that you made about metadata being the dry side. I think uh, oftentimes we, we fall in love, obviously, with our books and our projects, and then we, like I said, these projects are born and they go into the world and we kind of think the world is done, but something as, as sort of banal as metadata is uh, absolutely critical to the process. Yeah, and uh, what, what we'll do, Dan, is uh, when, when we post this online, Uh, the folks that are listening today or those that will in the future uh, can click on to really understand um, how to make sure that your book is very discoverable through good metadata. It's okay. really, um, just, really great just, time. 
just so you know, there's a there's a little hiccup somewhere, a uh, little hiccup with it. So I don't see your video anymore. Not that uh, not that that's absolutely essential for this, but there may be a little slowdown in the uh, in the uh, internet. So we should just uh, keep keep moving, and hopefully your face will come back. Oh boy. Okay. Can is the screen still visible yep. for the slides? Yep. I can I can still see your presentation. Well, that's what's most important because I am not the best looking guy in the world anyway. So, all right. Next question. Right. Next question, how do I appropriately discount my titles for wholesale? So, you know, I was just talking about that, and I think this is probably as or more important than price, because when you, for instance, go to Amazon, um, what you tend to look at, um, and it's proven by Amazon, is what is the discount that's being put on the title. And so for a retailer, while they care about what you're putting down for the, the list price, the, the ability for them to further discount a title is, is absolutely essential. And so, um, you know, what we recommend is if you want to sell, get the best exposure for your book. I know it sounds steep, but a 55% discount on your title will give it the best possible exposure. Again, whether it's in retail, e-tail, library, et cetera. And what we find 9.7 times out of 10 is that those that put the full trade discount typically will sell far, uh, will sell more than enough books to compensate for possibly being a little stingier and putting a lower discount. Absolutely your call, but in the trade world, it's essential. I would say if you're doing an academic title, you could get by with a lower discount because those tend to be uh, at a lower discount, but uh, the trade discount absolutely essential okay and uh, this is a question that I know that probably a hundred percent of the people who put a book into the world are, are asking themselves uh, right now and every other day which is how do I make money after all of this because I know for a lot of people seeing that 55 percent discount they just feels like a dagger but I think what, what you just said it, there is a system in place and this is how it works sort of globally and don't don't get swayed by the idea that you're giving a fifty you're giving everything away because there's still potential to make money here. Absolutely, and so you know again this is this is where the publishing industry plays today. And so when you when you enter into the publishing industry market, and and again your books are going to be compared against you know traditional trade publishers. Um, it's it's just one of the realities. But again, what we find, like I said. Um, almost all the time is that when you when you're willing to go at that level of a discount, you will more than compensate it with with uh, with increased sales. Because there's just some retailers, if you have a slow, if, if you have a small discount, they just won't pick up the title no matter how interesting it is. So what I did here was I just did a little math problem to show you essentially how uh, and what you would make. And it's you know on average. Um, Again, and what's great about this is you don't have to pay royalties uh, for the most part if you're listening to this because you are the author, right? Um, now, you may be a small press where you do pay uh, royalties, so I don't want to discount that. But the reality is is that you know, you'll make somewhere around, on average, about 25% of the retail price. And so this is exactly what I've shown here. Um, the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, 1999. If you apply a 50, 55% discount to that, your, your, your net sale is going to be $8.99. And then again, I, I did a real world example of what Huck Finn would have priced out at for POD, which again, looks expensive. When you look at each individual element, it can be uh, a little daunting, but you know, in the end, this author who put Huck Finn into the market is gonna make five bucks or 25% of the overall sale price. Um, not too bad. Again, depending on, um, and that's a that's a higher price point um, POD book because it has so many pages. But you know, again, depending on your page count, you can make anywhere from I would say twenty percent all the way up to as much as forty forty five percent, depending on what your pricing comes out at. And so, um, yeah, so you're going to make you know. Um, what we would say is uh, a, a fair a fair market value on that. If you lowered the discount, sure, you would make more, but you would sell less. So just two things. One, if anybody out there can write a book like Huckleberry Finn, I think you're in good shape. <laughs> uh, 
And number two, uh, this is kind of an obscure question, but maybe it is, maybe it isn't. So let's say that as an author, I know that in a lot of other aspects of being an artist today, an author, photographer, whatever, the idea of an author being able to bring uh, an audience of people to the discussion is really important. So if you're someone, let's say that you're someone that has a massive social following, does that influence that discount at all? So potentially if you're bringing a massive following in, Maybe you don't need the 55% discount. Maybe you can do the middle discount discount because you're already bringing so many people to the table. Does that make sense or does that impact anything? It makes perfect sense, but unfortunately what we're talking about are um, retail market dynamics, right? So again, um, uh, when you put a lower discount, it, it's, not a, it's not the way you would necessarily have thought about it where if I'm, you know, again, if I'm uh, James Patterson or Dean Koontz, um, I can sell it in at a lower discount. It just doesn't work that way. In fact, uh, often um, those are the types of publishers and authors where retailers really will press hard on for the best possible terms that they can get because they're putting a lot of money. Okay, that makes sense. Fortunately, it just doesn't work that way. That makes sense. Well, that's been established in the marketplace. And so again, you know, if, if, if you're skeptical of it or you, you feel like you want to hold on to a little bit more money, um, you know, you can always try it at a, uh, at a lower percentage or do one book if you've got a couple books out there at a lower percentage and put the other one at a higher percentage. But again, you know, by and large, this is kind of what's, what's tried and true and known in the market. Okay, excellent. So um, I think that's going to be pretty much the questions we came up with. And so um, I'm just going to give a quick summary here. And then it um, um, looks like we've got a, a good balance of time left to entertain any other questions in there. But let me just kind of conclude with a couple reminders. Um, number one, why, why would you be doing this? Why would you want further distribution? And again, it's going back to that definition of publishing. You want to make your words more widely known. Um, this is a great vehicle to do that. Um, uh, I think Amazon is certainly a great way to do it. And if you've got a photo book and want to put that book directly in, I think that's great. But, you know, by and large, um, it's a much bigger world out there. And so to expand that access of your book, this is a way where you can make incrementally more than what you would have um, had you not done it, right? So a lot of times we think about, discount and uh, price and all of these things and we think well you know um, I don't know it doesn't seem like I'm making a whole lot of money but keep in mind um, those that choose not to are making none and so your ability to put this in is going to um, net you um, something positive positive. Um, and again you know a lot of questions we sometimes get is well why don't I just print a large volume of books and then Ingram can buy them. First off, we don't have warehouses big enough to store uh, a, a copy of everyone's book. And so our only method of working with um, only the everyone except for the, the large publishers is to do this virtual print-on-demand model. Um, and again, we think it makes sense for most of the market in that we're really not uh, printing or you're getting charged for a book until somebody actually um, pays with cash for that, especially in an online market. And we'll never miss a sale. We'll never be out of stock of a book. Uh, I think it's another important thing. Um, keeps all your titles in print uh, for as long and forever. Um, and you really are reaching a global market. And ultimately, um, while uh, this isn't necessarily the thing to say for an artist, see and uh, and hear me can you guys still see and hear me okay so I'm getting a yes all right great so uh, this happens obviously with uh, technology and webinars this uh, pops off uh, here and now uh, oddly enough my internet and audio were kind of spotty earlier but now it seems to be doing fine so I've got a list of questions that y'all have been sending in that I will um, when Kelly returns here I will I can. can you guys hear me? There we go. Um, I can hear you, but I can't see you. 
Okay. Uh, it looks like it just shut itself off. Uh, what did we did we end uh, the slides at an appropriate pl place? Yeah, I think so. I've got a list of questions that people have sent in, so we can we can sort of slowly start moving our, our way through those. If you want to, you want to do that. Yep. Um, the first one is a is a redirect back to something you said before, and I'm actually very curious about this as well, which goes back to the code. And I think you said it was a BISC code. BISC. And and, and re, can you re-explain what that is and where someone would find that code to apply? Okay. So first, where would you find it? And again, we'll put these resources um, as part of the webinar. But if you go to the bisg.org, that's bookindustrystudygroup.org, um, this is the industry group that creates all of the metadata requirements for books. And one of the important things that they do is they create these BISAC codes which help you to identify. So it's everything from fiction general, which I would which I would suggest if you have a fiction book, don't put general, put what it is. It, you get every, every choice that you could ever imagine for fiction from prairie romance to um, some very salacious uh, kinds of uh, descriptors. How did you know that prairie romance was my favorite genre? <laughs> I was just guessing. There's some sort of bond happening here. Okay, so we've uh, the next question that we've had is what do you think about uh, when you when we show we saw the pie chart of the t of the sort of books that are selling the most now? How does uh, tr how do travel books fit into that? Would they be in the trade section, and is that a popular genre? Yeah, travel would fit into the trade section. And again, um, what's cool about travel, uh, especially coming from a smaller publisher or author base, is this is your entree into the local store. And so um, many stores will carry a local travel section, and they will typically um, be very interested in a local travel book from somebody who lives locally within that area, if that's what your focus is on. But again, yeah, travel, you know, a lot of people think with the advent of uh, section is not doing well, it's actually selling pretty well. Okay, excellent. Um, another question here is, this is from Michael in Canada. And he says, uh, he asked, would Ingram be a good platform to sell large format art books? My father's a famous Canadian artist, and we're looking into making a large landscape book of his work with Gatefold. So we're talking custom fine art book. And, and this is just my, my response to that, um, having talk, spoken to friends who've been in art book publishing for a long time. And I think this is something that I, I came from the photography world, and I spent my life as a photographer, and everybody obviously wants to do books. And uh, historically, photo books through time, in terms of sales numbers, have never been the highest selling. You know, they've always been difficult, expensive to produce. Someone needs to subsidize the process. Um, you know, going back in time, it could have been the church and the crown subsidizing. And now, oftentimes, it's the artist himself. So to Michael's question, is, is, a, is a pretty complex art book, is that also a, a decent thing to send through the system? Yeah, you know, um, great question. First off, I would say, if it's a high-end art book, um, while print-on-demand can do great things, um, it's not going to necessarily be able to print on a silver halide paper or, or something along those lines. And so to the extent that you would have to, um, quote-unquote, you know, degrade it from, uh, from something that's a high-end value to something that would fit a blurb format, you know, you just, you just want to be careful there, I would say you would probably want to go the more traditional blurb print route and see if you were able to sell it indirectly. Okay. Um, you know, I was hoping for the magic pill answer for every, every photographer friend I have in the world was waiting for you to say, yes, you just do these three things and you'll be famous. So that, that's what we're all looking for. Um, this is just an irony here. It's a Kelly from, it's a question from Kelly to Kelly, two different Kellys. Is, and, and I can answer this one. Is Ingram directly accessible through the blurb seller dashboard? And, the answer to that, Kelly, uh, the remote Kelly, is yes. When you're on your author page, you have the option of uh, just selecting what kind of distribution method you want, and you'll see Blurb, the Blurb Bookstore. You'll see Amazon, and you'll see Ingram on there, and you just toggle that that box, and you're and you're starting through. Speaking of Ingram and Blurb, uh, someone wrote in earlier and asked about the difference between sending a Blurb through the uh, book through the Blurb Ingram platform as opposed to going directly to Ingram Spark. And what the differences were in that in that uh, scenario? Yeah. So again, 
Good question. Um, so Spark was really designed, Ingram Spark was really designed as a DIY model, meaning um, for $49, you could put your book into the Ingram Wholesale Network, but um, it, you, were, you were required to have a book that was fully compliant and capable of, um, of printing within Lightning Source and going into the wholesale channel. Uh, you know what blurb offers is 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 a slightly different model where you have tools and resources to help uh, publishers you know create that book for them or with them right with some of the blurb um, design tools and so um, so a little bit different market you know uh, I would say you know we've got a great relationship with blurb and with spark and it's really for the author to kind of choose where they best fit Okay, and uh, back to the genre. Uh, some a couple of people have written in about uh, photo poetry books. Is that a, a relevant sort of uh, a relevant sort of a path to go down? Right now, or, or viably sellable. Um, and uh, and so you know the poetry. Can you hear me? Okay. I can. It was a little little hitched up there. I wasn't sure if that was on my end or on someone else's. Else's I'm sure it would be, we'll make it your fault this time. Um, no, but uh, poetry is really a hot topic. I was saying it's really what coloring books were a couple years ago. Um, and so, um, you know, it's, um, I, I see this as, as kind of a long opportunity, uh, especially because short form, anything short form right now is, is really hot, whether it's short form fiction, short stories, um, quick DIY books because people have less time. Um, and so, yep, good topic. Okay, good. Um, and that's surprising to me. I would, I would have thought poetry books would have been incredibly difficult to sell. It's amazing how, uh, you know, if you spend the, the, the tr I think the, the tricky part for people is that starting with great content is obviously something that, you know, gets, it gets a little bit overlooked in the process. If you're, people ask all the time, you know, hey, I want to do a photo book. What's the secret to making a good photo book? And the, the, the obvious thing is you've got to start with the best possible work that you can create as an artist. That, that's the baseline before that happens. But then you've got this entirely separate world of navigating the distribution space that you've got to learn. And it's a, it's a, lot, of, uh, it's a lot of information to, to take down. Just Ingram itself is a lot to learn sure. how to navigate. Um, someone had a question specifically about the Latin American market. Is there any information you can direct in that, that direction? Sure, so you know, through Ingram International, um, we, we really, uh, the, the Latin American market is probably Ingram International's largest sales uh, network, um, uh, Apart from you know perhaps obviously the UK and some parts of, uh, of of Europe, but as far as from a foreign language standpoint or English language, you know the Latin American market is really burgeoning right now. Whether it's uh, Spain or uh, Central South America, we see lots of growth opportunity in that market, and Ingram is very well connected to uh, quite a few retailers in that marketplace. And why do you think that that market in particular is taking off? Is it just because they've had lack of access to things in the past for whatever reason? You know, um, I think the economies there are pretty sick, uh, cyclical. Um, many of the um, many of those economies are in a bit of a rebound right now. Not all of them, certainly. Um, and and you know, um, there's some great literature coming out, uh, Latin literature right now. And so it's it's probably a combination of multiple things. Yeah, some of my favorite authors are uh, are Latin authors. It's uh, I was on a kick a, a couple of years ago where I all I did was read Latin American authors, and I, it's just amazing what's uh, what's coming out of that region. One of my all time favorite places in the world, by the way. On a side note, uh, Maxine wrote in, and this is more of a question I can answer. I've created the book on Blurb and wonder if it's an easy transition to Ingram. An easy transition in the sense of yes, of, of allowing that book to be to be transitioned into the Ingram system. Yes, it's just a, Maxine's just a, a, a click of the uh, one button basically, uh, and then choosing which, which uh, discount method that you've, uh, you want to uh, go after. But yes, it's pretty easy. And um, let me see here, this is an interesting, uh, this is a really interesting question from Michael. Uh, and this would, 
This would apply to, um, and I'll give me a very specific uh, case in point. So a, a couple of years ago, I did a collaborative project with another photographer and a designer. We did, a, we did this small book, and I would describe it as just a small run art book where the idea was to have 50 or 100 copies total, sell it out, and then continue to make books in the series. And once they're sold out, as you know, uh, uh, scarcity breeds demand. And then, you know, potentially these things are sold out before we even create them. So Michael wrote in and said, is it possible to set a book run for a limited edition? So uh, is there a way to put it into Ingram and say, look, there's only 100 copies of this and then it's gone? Yeah, sure. I mean, all you really need to do in that case, um, and this I would push back to uh, somebody in the, uh, the blurb headquarters is, you know, basically when you, when you take a book out of, uh, out of the distribution system, right? So no different than the question that Monica had to put a book in, my guess is to take a book out of your system. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really just a matter of, um, you know, delisting the book and what I would suggest you do, that's just more of a technical thing, but what you want to be able to do is in your book description, metadata or subtitle, make sure that you put something like limited edition um, or uh, something around that so that people know that there's some level of, uh, of, of scarcity. Um, it hurts me to say that because I believe that with the models that we built today that no book should go out of print, but um, or at least for a short time or create another version or do something, but uh, yeah, you can certainly do that. No, you're absolutely right. It, it is a weird sort of uh, a transition where you're like, wait a second, why would you why would you make something that you can't uh, you know that you can't get all the time? So um, there was a question hey, here. That I just uh, one other one other cool thing about that is uh, I'll give you a good example is um, we work in the graphic novels market. So I don't know if there's any graphic novel authors on the call today, but. Um, you know, typically when a, when a graphic novel book comes out, it comes out, uh, you know, there's some very nice, beautiful, you know, high gloss, heavyweight paper graphic novels, um, but they can never afford to reprint these things, right? And so what we're working with with a lot of graphic novel producers is to say, you know, the, the second version or the second life, and that's kind of the term we use, um, it's okay to make it POD because, um, and, and maybe with a nice paper, but not uh, the best possible paper, because it, it, it allows it to have a second life. And so sometimes we might wanna think about, you know, how could we extend the life of something? And we've gotten a really great uh, response from authors that uh, think about it maybe in extending a life uh, by not necessarily putting it out of print permanently. Okay, um, this just question came in on my phone. Uh, do we need an account with Ingram, and is there a cost involved? Uh, again, this is all done through Blurb, and so um, no, you uh, you will um, all of this will be managed through Blurb, and so there's no cost to the author, um, and Blurb really is going to manage all of the upfront uh, responsibility for you. Hopefully, I said that right, Blurb. Yes, you did, um, okay. and just. This isn't more of a, a question here. This is a statement, but this question has come in a bunch about Ingram Spark, and I just want to say that Ingram Spark is another print-on-demand book printing service and online ebook publishing tool. Um, this is an interesting question. Where can one access selling trends by topic, current top topics versus upcoming, so that they can potentially quote ride the wave of that publishing publishing uh, genre? Yeah, so first thing I would say is you should do Google Alerts and, um, and, and you know, put in, again, some keywords in Google Alerts that talk about, um, you know, uh, books and book sales uh, um, and because Publishers Weekly is another great resource. Um, the American Association of Publishers, the AAP, publishes statistics that um, they'll put out press releases um, in – in their uh, study, and then uh, books, Nielsen Book Scan again. I know I've just rattled off about three or four. That's another thing we can put in the FAQ as far as where to find good information on book statistics. Okay, um, there's the, I have one question that I want to ask last, which it goes back to sort of rookie mistakes. But I want to ask this one, uh, and because I think this is pretty interesting, and I know there's a lot of people out there, including a lot of my friends. This is the kind of question that they would ask. This is from Meg, uh, and of course it just disappeared. Oh, what? Wow, there's things coming in. The, the chats are coming in so fast. I have, I'm trying, having a hard time hovering. 
What would you say the benefits are to using Ingram versus selling the book from your own website if you confront the cost of a large book order? And, and from my perspective, that's a pretty, uh, pretty simple question to answer because you're talking about a POD, POD system versus an offset system where you've paid for this, you've put all your money up front, paid for this. Um, just Meg, just so you know, first of all, you have to be you have to be ready to accept and store those books, and that for a lot of people is. I mean, I just spent the last three days in New York City, and are you ready for a pallet of books to show up at, at your walk up in New York and have a place to put those? Secondly, you are shipping and distribution, and you have to understand just how much work that actually is. Uh, whereas with Ingram, you're going through the POD system, which goes back to the slide that Kelly showed, whereas the old model was print the book, sell the book, and now it's sell the book, print the book. So would you would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, certainly. And, you know, there are going to be times when you want to sell direct. And I would say sometimes it's a combination. What we see more and more is that publishers will order a very small quantity. Um, and because you can get decent prices still on a small quantity, because if you're going to speak at a conference, you know, you want to have those books that you can sell direct. Um, related to just trying to do it on a website, again, you're absolutely right, Dan. There's just a whole lot. Again, many you know, press. So just so you know, I just lost my audio. So I have no, I no longer have video of Kelly or audio. So I'm staring at myself. Uh, let me see here what's going on. Okay, so SD lost this as well. Um, so I just, I just lost him again. So there's something obviously happening with his, uh, with his system, which we have no control over. Uh, and oddly enough, we are almost. Uh, at the end of the webinar. So the timing on this uh, technical technical snafu was was almost perfect. So if you're going to have a technical snafu at 57 minutes into an hour, I think we timed it pretty well. So a couple of people are writing in here. Justin, hey Justin, how are you? Uh, my, my bud from Albuquerque who can't hear or see Kelly either. So let's just wait a second for him to come back. Hopefully he can come back in. We can thank him for uh, for taking the time to be here. Again, this is gonna be archived and, and put back out there. There are a lot of questions that have come in. You guys have done an amazing job of asking incredibly relevant questions, which tells me that a lot of people on this website are not only focused, but are also really have the potential to do this because you're asking very insightful questions. This is a complicated process. And like I mentioned at the very beginning, getting your book done. First of all, just creating fantastic content. We all know how difficult that is. And then it's getting that book designed, edited, sequenced, uh, the trim size determined, the materials, et cetera, putting it out. It, it's tough. And then you've got this thing on the end, uh, this, this really the third part of the equation on the end, which is distribution and marketing and put it out. It's a really uh, complex scenario. Um, I've been informed that I should mention the one sheet. Hang on a second, let me see here. Now I'm having technical problems with my phone. Mention the one sheet with all uh, info for all the distribution options with Blurb, not just Ingram. So that's a great point. Uh, one of the items that was attached during the webinar in the upper right hand side, which you can see with the little red, uh, the little red numeric value at the top right, that, that one sheet has all of the Blurb systems. So from the Blurb uh, bookstore to the Amazon distribution and to Ingram. And again, each one of those offers uh, diff differing levels of complexity. I would say that Ingram is the most complex and then Amazon and then Blurb. You can sell certain formats on certain networks and you can't sell other formats on certain networks. So again, it just takes a few, a few moments to run through this. I literally printed this out myself. Uh, this morning because I have to go through it from time to time and refresh the information because it's a lot. I, I don't put many books out into the market that I am trying to sell to a wide audience. I do a lot of books that are small run art books where there's say 25 or 50 copies. They're signed and numbered. Um, and Michael, uh, I saw your question. I don't know which Michael you are, but the one about having your book signed, I think that's a really relevant question too. Uh, I don't specifically know the answer to that through Ingram, but uh, I'm sure that Kelly does. So uh, we really appreciate you guys coming and tuning in. And apparently Kelly's not not coming back. So uh, the internet the internet gods were were angry at something. So uh, 
but anyway, we had we had a, a good time with you all. Thank you so much for participating. And uh, we will be back with uh, another webinar in the coming weeks. And again, this will be archived on YouTube. And uh, make sure to check the attachments that we sent in. Thank you for the questions. Wait, oh, here we are. He's back. I, I lied. I just told him you weren't coming back. So we have well, you back for one final thing. Uh, all, all just to say goodbye. And uh, uh, we can trust the force, but apparently we can't trust the, the internet these days. Yes, just real quickly, uh, the, the, last, the last thing I'm going to say, uh, Patricia wrote in, it said a lot of questions about photo books. I don't see many answers. Is Ingram a platform for these or not? Um, yeah, absolutely. Again, depends on what kind of photo book you're trying to produce. Um, we do a lot of photo books on a, um, a, a nice heavier weight paper for distribution into the marketplace. Um, we don't do high-end photo books. That's really Blurb's expertise. Okay, excellent. And Patricia, to those questions, the high-end photo books that you would do through Blurb uh, are going to be distributed through the Amazon side. So, and again, that's on the handout that we sent out as a part of this webinar. So that's a great place to start to get a foundation. So Kelly, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. That was wonderful. That is so much information. I hope people understand like what a window into this world that really was. And we really appreciate you being here with us. And hopefully we can, uh, we can set this up again sometime. That's great. Hey, thanks everyone for your time and uh, apologize for the technical difficulties, but um, in the end, uh, hopefully we will help everyone uh, kind of make their books, uh, uh, they're more widely known around the world. Absolutely. Thank you so much and thanks everyone for attending and we'll see you uh, next month.